James and Arminda Lynch came to North Texas by way of Arkansas, eager to take advantage of the state's new Homestead Act. And if you're an avid listener of this show, you already know that some things really are too good to be true. The Lynch family managed to stick it out for nearly 15 years, but by 1877, Arminda's rheumatism had gotten so bad she could barely lift her arms. And when all six of their children came down with malaria that summer, they decided it was time to sell their farm in Denison and head west for the Palo Pinto Mountains. They knew nothing about the place, only that it was higher and drier ground, and a change of air was literally what the doctor ordered. Granted, that was the go-to prescription for pretty much everything from allergies to tuberculosis, but surely it was better than nothing. Even so, it was a dangerous journey to make. Only a few months earlier, a posse of nearly 200 Comanche warriors, led by Black Horse, had raided a camp of buffalo hunters in the area in a last stand for revenge and justice that we will definitely do an episode on at some point. But for now, just know that white settlers were justifiably on edge about traveling through the region. And from what historians can tell, it's pretty damn likely that the Lynch family would have known the risk they were taking. But when your family is sick and desperate, you'll risk anything to save them, which is something we might do well to remember today. It was Christmas Eve, 1877, when the Lynches crossed the Brazos River in the middle of a roiling thunderstorm. As soon as they reached the opposite bank, a bolt of lightning struck dead one of their oxen mere feet away from where they huddled in the wagon. Another simply keeled over from exhaustion on the spot. It felt like a bad omen with a long shadow like whatever luck they'd had was long gone, swept away in the river's current. The trip had taken its toll on all of them, but Arminda most of all. James feared that if they pressed on in this wet, biting cold, they might lose her. Wherever they were, and whatever it meant, their journey ended here. So they shivered out the night beneath the wagon canopy, just grateful to have each other. When the skies finally cleared on Christmas Day, the Lynch family found themselves in a wide open valley nestled between two mountains, or hills for those of you who don't speak Texan. The soil seemed promising enough and a handful of other recent arrivals had already set up camp nearby. And it was beautiful. Maybe, James thought, this was where they were supposed to be all along. They purchased an 80 acre plot there in Millsap Valley and set to work making it their home. James and some of the neighbors attempted to dig a well, but gave up around the 40-foot mark without so much as a trickle. For the next two years, James and his eldest sons made the daily four-mile hike to the Brazos just to fetch as much water as they could carry in pails. Finally, in July of 1880, a man with some drilling equipment happened to wander through the valley, and James offered him a couple of oxen in exchange for a proper well. The man agreed, dug till the water broke the dirt, and was on his way. But there was something wrong with the water. It stank like rotting eggs and tasted about the same. The family feared it might be poison, but they'd already invested so much, and their health issues were only getting worse by the day. They knew it wouldn't be long before their daily hike to the river wasn't a trip their deteriorating bodies could make. So they decided to test it out, and gave the reeking water to one of the oxen, just to be sure. They gave it a few days, but the animal seemed just fine. At that point, they didn't feel like they had much left to lose. Poison or not, at least it'd make for a quicker death than exhaustion or disease. Arminda and the kids held their noses and drank, but James opted to hold out, at least for now. If the foul stuff made him sick or worse, at least he'd still be there to care for him. But after only a few weeks of imbibing the rank, sulfurous water, the children were feeling great, better than great. And, as if by miracle, Arminda's rheumatism had all but disappeared. There was no arguing with the results, so James drank up. And sure enough, it only took a week or two before his own arthritis began to clear up. Word spread fast through their tiny community, and much to James' surprise, well beyond it. Within a month or so, the sick, the lame, and the curious alike were traveling from all over to come try the miracle water for themselves. And not just a few dozen here and there, but thousands. According to one news report, James was dishing out more than 60 gallons of the stinky water every morning by 10 a.m., so much that the well's production couldn't keep up with the demand. He had to start selling tickets for five cents a pop, one quart per person per day. And still, he was selling out of the stuff every afternoon, with a long line of disappointed folks still lined up to get their fill. With no sign that the crowds would be dwindling anytime soon, James started asking people to sign legal-ish documents to affirm their medical need for the water before they could even get a jug. 
people started pouring into the settlement in droves, and by the end of the year, upwards of 3,000 people were camped out in tents on the Lynch family property, self-medicating on the miracle water. Even the post office in the nearest town of Ednaville packed up and moved to Lynch's scenic little valley. The people looked to James as a kind of leader and healer, and before long, the locals took to calling him Judge. But all these strangers living in tents on the family farm, many of them sick and likely contagious, wasn't exactly ideal. So James decided to subdivide the acreage and sell off the plots. Once he drew up the plans though, he couldn't help but notice that he was basically laying out a town. So he went with it and declared himself the first mayor of a new township, Mineral Wells, Texas. Some residents fancied themselves prospectors of sorts and began digging wells of their own, hoping for a lucky strike of that stinky liquid gold. And in 1881, the same year Pedro Jaramillo first set foot in Texas some 400 miles away, a man named Uncle Billy Wiggins hit the mother load. His well turned out to be one of the most productive and by far the most famous in the town, the Crazy Well. Named for an elderly spinster the local school children unkindly referred to as the Crazy Woman. Depending on the source, she suffered from epilepsy or dementia or some vaguely defined craziness, or, quote, hysterical mania caused by disorders peculiar to her sex. God. Whatever it was that ailed her, legend had it she drank the miracle water from Uncle Billy's well every day, and she was cured. The town's notoriety was growing exponentially, and its population along with it. With the help of some persistent locals, the railroad finally came through, connecting the town to the world and bringing the world to Mineral Wells. Jubilant crowds gathered on the platform on New Year's Day, 1891, to welcome the first train of the Weatherford, Mineral Wells, and Northwestern Railway, rolling into town a mere decade after the Lynch family had first crossed the Brazos. The name was a bit of a mouthful, though, and the acronym WMW and NW was somehow even worse. It became a kind of running joke among the locals who liked to tell curious tourists it stood for water, more water, and no whiskey. Or whiskey, more whiskey, and no water, depending on which side of the temperance debate they happen to be on. Personally, I think the latter has more of a ring to it, and it's certainly the kind of regimen we're taking today. The train didn't just bring in tourists and money. It also provided a distribution line for shipping the miracle water all over the country. New water companies seemed to be popping up every day, and soon just about everyone in town was building wooden pavilions around their personal wells to serve up the healing elixir to the never-ending throngs of tourists. And those tourists needed a place to sleep that was a little better than a tent or the occasional room for let. And the first hotel, the Hexagon, was arguably the coolest, both figuratively and literally. Rancher David G. Galbraith came to town from Colorado City and spent several weeks taking mineral baths, hoping to ease the pain of his rheumatism. But he got more than relief. He got a cure. And in the summer of 1895, he sold his ranch and moved out to Mineral Wells. Lodging facilities were in short supply at the time, and a hotel seemed like it might be a good investment. Galbraith didn't have much experience with that kind of thing, but he was a skilled electrician and an aspiring inventor and he threw himself completely into the project. Drawing on his lifelong fascination with honeybees and the hexagonal shape of their honeycombs, he drew up meticulous blueprints for a five-story hotel and supervised every aspect of its construction. Nearly everything in the hotel was hexagonal. The rooms, the tiles, the dishware, even the airflow. Almost every room in the building had three outward-facing windows pointed slightly different directions, which allowed for cross-ventilation and maximum circulation, basically the closest thing to air conditioning you could get 61 years before it was invented. To give you an idea of the time period we're talking about here, when the hotel got a telephone, its number was literally just six. If you like old, spooky, totally rad buildings, it's definitely worth a Googling. Did I mention that it had giant pentacles hung over each of the top story windows and we couldn't find a single explanation why? Doesn't matter, that's bottom line badass. Local lore likes to claim Galbraith invented the paperclip, but that's not exactly true. Sorry, y'all. In 1910, he did successfully patent a new and improved version of the paperclip, but it never really took off. After all, it was shaped like a hexagon. He did invent some other things though, like synthetic fiber acetate, which we also tried to Google and still have no idea what that is. But he did build the first electrical power plant in Mineral Wells, providing electricity to every room in the hotel, which was a rarity at the time. 
and on its opening day in December 1897, the Hexagon Hotel literally lit up the whole town. And for Mineral Wells, Texas, it was just the beginning. At the turn of the 20th century, the town had more than 20 mineral water companies in operation and upwards of 150,000 visitors arriving by train every year. And for some perspective, the local population at the time was only around 8,000, and nearly every one of them was in the water business, either working at the spas, bars, and clinics, or in the hotels, restaurants, and stores that popped up around them. And it wasn't just the sick and desperate who were flooding into the beautiful little valley on the Brazos. Mineral water resorts were gaining traction among spiritualist and alternative healing circles, and it was only a matter of time before they caught on with celebrities and other wealthy folks who had the money to burn and the pathological need to stay hip to the next big thing. In cultural hubs like Austin and Fort Worth, magnetic healers were holding weekly performances, or medical demonstrations, at sold-out theaters and opera houses. But two of the most prominent magnet wizards of Texas preferred the health clinic to the spotlight. The brothers Milling, Native sons of Erath County, Texas, known throughout the Southwest as George and Roscoe, the famous Rubbin' Doctors. Roscoe Milling had opened several sanitariums in Texas, including one in Mineral Wells, and he was considered something of a pioneer of Texas medicine at the time. But like a lot of irregular healers in those days, the medical establishment and the law were on his tail, trying to bust him for practicing without a license. But the charges didn't stick. He evaded them by claiming to be a masseur rather than a healer, and besides, his only compensation was free hotel rooms. And for all his showmanship, Roscoe wasn't a huckster. He seems to have had a genuine empathy for the people he treated, and he actually engaged his critics in a refreshingly honest and straightforward way. He might not have been providing anything more than a hot tub massage with a few bells and whistles, but his patients believed, and the peace that that brought them was undeniably real. At the end of a long career as an antagonist of mainstream medical science, he died in a Dallas hospital in 1925, undergoing kidney surgery that he'd put off until it was long overdue. But still, as late as the 1960s, people were still spinning yarns of his magic powers, claiming he could turn tap water into mineral water simply by touching the glass. Decades later, it landed him in Ripley's Believe It or Not billed as Dr. Roscoe Gorman Milling of Cisco, Texas, who taught himself hypnotism and would touch a glass of water and convince a patient it was an effective medicine. His brother George was a rubbin' doctor himself, but never quite lived up to Roscoe's fame. According to author Gene Fowler, George had, quote, expansiveness of personality, which is a nice quaint way of saying getting shithoused in a dry town and driving around, randomly firing a pistol and screaming at strangers. That is, until the summer of 1914, when a guy in the nearby town of Ferry had had enough of George's expansive personality and shot him dead in the street with a double barrel shotgun. Important side note, Gene Fowler's book Crazy Water was by far the best and most cited source we used in writing this miniseries. It's fantastic, and if you have any interest in this subject, please check it out. So, thanks Gene. Anyway. After Milling's death, Dr. George Snyder stepped into the role of Mineral Wells' celebrity miracle man. Locals took to calling him the strange little man, or more formally, the little wizard. Snyder claimed to be a clairvoyant psychic healer, capable of performing miracle cures with his mind. He came to Mineral Wells in 1915 with 60 bucks in his pocket and not much else, and within only a few short years, he had one of the premier sanitariums in the state. And unlike the Milling brothers, the little wizard had no issue with charging for his services. But plenty of people were willing to pay, and he garnered national fame as the Little Faith Healer down in Texas. Despite his claims to psychic powers, Dr. Snyder actually specialized in reverse psychology, manipulation, and just plain meanness. He once told a woman with an unfaithful husband that she was so pretty and well-dressed she might as well kill herself if she couldn't keep a man. For real, he actually said that. He also preferred to avoid house calls and instead treat people long distance through what he called thought transference. Despite being an obvious and ridiculous fraud, he hated fortune tellers and would actually hypnotize their customers and then command them to go home and violently curse out the fortune tellers until they left town. And apparently more than a few times that actually worked. To be fair, Snyder and his wife were also frequent visitors to the spas at Mineral Wells, so at least they gave something back to the community, I guess. The town was becoming a cultural hub in its own right, 
professional baseball teams from all over the country came to relax and heal at the spas. There were carousels, ice cream parlors, and even a 2,500-seat outdoor amphitheater, which, over the years, played host to vaudeville reviews, religious revivals, operas, and grotesquely vile minstrel shows. William Jennings Bryan even gave a speech there once. Awkward juxtaposition, very much intended. In an attempt to attract even more upscale business to the region, the locals pooled the town's resources and invested about a million dollars in the construction of a luxury hotel, right on top of Crazy Water Well No. 3. It was a massive undertaking, but when the four-story Crazy Hotel opened for business in 1912, the rooms were already booked for weeks in advance by business leaders, politicians, and celebrities from all over the world. When the oil boom hit three years later, Mineral Wells was perfectly positioned between the oil town of Ranger and the relatively far-off big city of Fort Worth to rake in the business. The industry made for a steady flow of customers to the crazy hotel and a lot of great press. The oil men had never seen anything like it. Phones, elevators, private indoor toilets in every room, and, of course, the water. As the owner of the hotel, Sidney Webb, put it at the time, quote, what Times Square is to New York, what State and Madison Streets are to Chicago, and what the Alamo is to San Antonio, the crazy hotel is to Mineral Wells. When the TMP Railroad Company bought the WM Whiskey whatever railroad two years later, they started advertising Mineral Wells in their quarterly magazine, and other local publications in the Dallas-Fort Worth area quickly followed their lead. A 1905 issue of the Dallas Arts Magazine, Beaumont, gushed, quote, here in the valley is said to be the fountain of health. Miracles are performed here every week, just as miracles were performed when the Nazarene walked with men. The dead are not restored to life. Everything else happens. Frequent palliations from the fountain of health robs the undertaker of his game. These are the tales one hears from men who affiliate with the church, attend prayer meetings, and contribute to the foreign mission fund. Would these good men lie? Perish the thought. Mineral Wells is becoming a sure enough health resort. Beauty doctors, palmists, fortune tellers, souvenir fakirs are flocking hither. This is a sign that Mineral Wells has a rove. The last part of that, at least, is true. Damn near overnight, a tiny town in the middle of nowhere, Texas, became a mecca for medical professionals of all stripes, the curious, critical, and quack alike, and the go-to vacation destination of the rich and famous. But with all that acclaim and attention, the medical establishment was starting to take notice. The Parker Palo Pinto County Medical Society, doing its best to keep up with the ever-evolving status quo, decided it was time to step in and step up their oversight. In 1915, after months of negotiation, a compromise was reached with all the water companies and mineral wells, allowing them to stay in business under the condition that they amend their labels and add some mandatory fine print. Quote, this is a natural saline alkaline mineral water, laxative and freely diuretic. The average person requires six to 15 glasses per day, but there are those who need less and others for whom this quantity will not suffice. Hence, drink just such quantity as gives the desired effect, if small or great. One to three glasses taken hot half an hour before breakfast will be found very effective. This label censored by Parker Palo Pinto County Medical Society. It might seem like the bare minimum to us now, but that kind of regulation was pretty much unheard of in those days. And besides, maybe a hundred years from now, they'll think it was crazy that we had TV commercials hawking pharmaceuticals. Or, you know, that people profited off of them. The Texas State Journal of Medicine applauded the decision as, quote, revolutionary, to say the least of it. They said they were turned off by the blatant commercialism of the ads put out by the water companies, given their, quote, intense and largely unintentional exaggeration. Right. The journal went on to say that they never doubted the efficacy of mineral water as medicine, so long as it was advertised appropriately, i.e. with only a little hyperbole, and that it was administered in an appropriate facility, like, say, a ritzy health spa. Call us cynical, but maybe the massive influx of people and wealth into their otherwise rural counties might have had something to do with their rosy conclusions. The American Medical Association, however, wasn't so lenient. Their in-house Bureau of Investigation published a booklet in 1916 trashing the mineral water industry, saying, quote, Mineral waters possess no mysterious or occult virtues in the treatment of disease. 
No mineral water will be accepted by the medical profession for alleged medicinal properties supported only by testimonials from bucolic statesmen or romantic old ladies. Cool. A large portion of the booklet was dedicated exclusively to shitting on Texan companies. The AMA apparently purchased large quantities of water from some of the biggest water companies in the state, two of which were in mineral wells, and then they had them tested. Crazy well water bottles were declared adulterated because they contained, quote, a filthy, decomposed, and putrid animal substance. And a federal court literally ruled that, quote, the product should be destroyed. A similar judgment was passed on Famous Water Company two years later, when they were charged with misbranding for all the false and dubious claims about the diseases the water supposedly cured. We'll get into that in a sec. The company pleaded guilty and paid a fine of $100 plus court fees. We didn't bother to put that through the inflation calculator though. Suffice it to say, it was barely a slap on the wrist. But all the legal issues barely registered in the news. Business was booming and the tiny town of Mineral Wells was on a meteoric rise to international fame and acclaim, whether the regulators and the gatekeepers liked it or not. Now seems like a good a time as any to address the big question. Did the miraculous cure-all mineral water actually work, or was it just stinky, burnt matches flavored LaCroix? And the answer is, uh, yes? Bathing in naturally hot springs or the heated waters of the resort spas definitely helped soothe tense muscles, and the bubbles felt nice, I'm sure, but they were basically just glorified hot tubs. The water had high concentrations of naturally occurring minerals like sodium, magnesium, and sulfates, all of which have been proven to be at least somewhat beneficial for overall health when ingested, but not enough to call it medicine, much less of a magical cure-all. As one Austin-based chemist put it at the time, you can get the same effect from taking Epsom salts. It's only marginally better than a placebo, but again, there's always something to be said for the power of belief, and there's definitely something to be said for the power of lithium, which is commonly used today to treat bipolar disorder and other mental illnesses. The waters only contained a small amount of the stuff, not really enough to be considered medically effective, but it still lends some credence to the whole crazy woman story. And while Mineral Wells might have been the most famous water town in Texas at the time, it was far from the only one. The first spa resorts popped up in Texas during the 1830s, mostly along the Gulf Coast. Davy Crockett is said to have dropped in for a dip every now and then, and the Confederate Army allegedly used the magical waters of Sour Lake to recharge the batteries in their telegraphs during the war. Sam Houston, suffering from skin disease and other maladies late in life, visited the spas in Grimes County and Sour Lake, hoping for a cure. Sadly, he never found it. As Fowler notes in his book, quote, Heartsick over the Civil War and his unpopularity for his stand that Texas should not secede from the Union, Houston went back to his home in Huntsville and died the following month. Between 1880 and 1919, mineral spring resorts cropped up all over the state, over a hundred of them most in sparse, rural areas that folks otherwise rarely visited or even passed through. The bathhouses, resorts, and spas may not have been as fancy as those up in the Northeast, but by the end of the 19th century, they were just as popular, if not more so. People were coming from all over the world to take the waters, as they say. The advent of the automobile made rural travel a readily accessible thing for the first time, and to accommodate all these new travelers, luxury hotels were popping up throughout the middle of hopeless nowhere. And there are some very solid arguments to be made that the modern layouts of highways, railroads, and even electrical infrastructure in rural Texas owe their very existence to this magical water fad. But the springs and wells weren't some new discovery. The natives of Texas had been using the waters for centuries, and as the trends of spiritualism and alternative healing were taking off, the horrific Indian removal campaigns waged throughout the American West were just beginning to wind down. By 1873, the buffalo had been completely wiped out in north central Texas, and the natives had either been run off or slaughtered right along with them. The decades long campaigns of violence cleared the way for white settlers like the Lynch family to swoop in and claim these ancient healing sites for their own. The rock tubs of Indian hot springs have been carved out by Apache warriors who used them to soothe their battle wounds throughout the centuries. By 1929, an El Paso-based corporation had built a resort complex over the sacred site, turning it into a vacation destination, patronized by the likes of President Taft, John D. Rockefeller, Pancho Villa, and the Vanderbilts. In Lampasas County, the Tonkawas had fought hard to keep their mineral water-rich lands, but the government ran them out, and by the 1850s, it was a luxury resort. 
The red water of Dalby Springs was considered hollowed ground among the Caddos, so much so that when white soldiers came for them in 1840, they set fire to their own village just to keep the invaders out, some of them even choosing to die in the flames rather than abandon the land of their ancestors. But by 1883, it too was a luxury resort. The same story played out again and again all over the state. The cruelty and breadth of the atrocities inflicted upon the native peoples of Texas in the name of expansion and greed was, and is, as unfathomable as it is unforgivable. It's a subject we've touched on before and will continue to touch on in this podcast. Not because we want to or because we're pushing some kind of agenda, but because it's an inextricable part of Texas history from beginning to end. If that makes any of our listeners uncomfortable, good. To borrow a phrase from some other podcast weeb, history doesn't care about your feelings. We both came up in the Texas public education system, and we know from experience that things like this were and are routinely left out or glossed over in the state curriculum. It's intentional, and it does a disservice to us all. It's absolutely crucial to remember that when it comes to what is or isn't included in our school textbooks, the final decision is solely that of partisan political actors with little or no background in history or education and a vested interest in teaching Texas children only what they want them to know. If that makes any of our listeners uncomfortable, also good. Call your representatives, get active in your local school boards, and vote. Anyway. Word of mouth may have been enough to bring folks out to James Lynch's weird little well in the 1880s, but this was the 20th century, and aggressive competition necessitated equally aggressive marketing campaigns. Miracle Spring Resorts and water companies were making all kinds of outlandish medical claims in their ads, each trying to outdo the next to convince buyers that their water was the superior brand. They touted their products as cures for everyday afflictions like backaches, insomnia, indigestion, pink eye, warts, baldness, the quote, inability to eat breakfast, and something called piles. While all of that was bullshit, it was mostly harmless bullshit. Unlike the company's bold claims of miracle cures for deadly diseases like malaria, cholera, alcoholism, diabetes, blood, liver, and kidney diseases, and even cancer. It's one thing if a bottle of water doesn't cure some sucker's constipation. It's quite another to steal much needed money from people who can't afford actual treatment or to callously give false hope to the families of someone dying from yellow fever. The claims rested almost entirely on folksy anecdotes, testimonies from the neighbor who just swears it cured grandma's gout, and the word of greedy opportunists who seized on the chance to rebrand their snake oil as a trendy cure-all. The rules were lax where they existed at all, and the explosion of advertising at the time turned the sulfurous water into a gold mine. Companies began hiring so-called boosters to accost people as soon as they got off the train, talking fast, cold reading their marks, tailoring their message, promising miracles, lying, bullshitting, and harassing them until the name of the boosters resort or spa was the only coherent thought left rattling around in their brains. Boosters were kind of like those sign spinners you see on the street corner if they screamed at you, banged on the hood of your car, and followed you home. And remember, not everyone taking the trip out to these spas were rich oilmen or the good old boys down at the state house. Many of them had scraped together everything they had in the world, borrowed money they could never pay back, praying that maybe, if God could find it in his heart of hearts to hear their prayers, that the torturous pain and suffering of their dying loved ones might finally find relief. Boosters, and the hotels that paid them, preyed on those fragile hopes like vampires, bilking the desperate for whatever few pennies they had left to their names. As the mayor of the water town Marlin, Texas put it, quote, You could not find their counterparts short of Hades. And that's coming from a guy whose town had gone from nothing nowhere to an economic boomtown in the span of a decade, entirely because of those very same companies. The Marlin City Council eventually passed an ordinance creating booster lines to keep the sales creeps at a safe distance from the visitors, and Texas state law soon followed suit. But imaginary poorly enforced boundaries couldn't do much to stop a dedicated booster from chasing down their prey or their commissions. And as much as the residents of these water towns loved all the money that was pouring in, they were starting to realize that maybe a little government oversight and accountability in business wasn't such a bad idea after all. State House reps from the city of Palestine proposed and passed legislation in 1909 to make untruthful and improbable claims about medicine an illegal, finable offense. The law also prohibited, quote, 
any physician, surgeon, etc., who is a habitual drunkard to continue the practice of medicine or surgery while a habitual drunkard, or the administering of any medicine or the performing of any operation while drunk. Weirdly, that was a big step for American healthcare law. Well, m- maybe not that weird, depending on how you look at it. But not everyone, especially the people getting rich, were all that keen on government overreach into their pocketbooks. Mineral water towns joined together with the support of local newspapers to form a political lobby big enough to rival a Texas medical establishment that was dead set on reining them in. In 1920, as the lobbyists battled to line pockets and grease hands, the founder and the first mayor of Mineral Wells, Judge James Lynch, passed away. His wife Arminda followed him soon after, and she was buried at his side in Elmwood Cemetery in the heart of the town they'd built together. It had been 40 years since they'd first choked down the water that, by miracle or belief, had cured what no doctor could. Whatever it was, and for what it's worth, Judge Lynch died at the ripe old age of 93. Two years later, the city erected a sign at the edge of East Mountain, overlooking the Lynch's resting place. The propped up block letters, bookended on either side by metal stars, instantly evokes the iconic Hollywood Hills sign in California. But it wasn't just some small town ripoff. The Los Angeles landmark wouldn't even be built for another year. Again, we don't like to read too much into coincidence, but given the constant influx of movie stars, socialites, and other influencers of the time, it's not entirely unthinkable that Hollywood, California may very well have taken their inspiration from Mineral Wells, Texas. We can't prove that, this is not a fact, but it is a legitimately real, maybe somewhat far-fetched possibility, and we like those kinds of possibilities. But in March of 1925, everything changed. A fire broke out along the perimeter of the crazy hotel, lapping black against the bricks and climbing up into the open windows, growing larger and hotter by the second, until within minutes, it was unstoppable. The sick and dying patients of the Mineral Wells Sanitarium next door were evacuated out into the streets with only seconds to spare as the flames erupted through the hallways and swallowed the structure whole. Twinkling glass and embers rained down onto the streets below, where a crowd had gathered to help the sick and the weak to safety, and to watch in horror as the heart and soul of their town, and their miraculous collective prosperity, collapsed beneath the roaring flames. Black smoke filled the night air infecting it, turning it bad, as it rose up over the hills and crept down into the valley to Elmwood Cemetery, obscuring the headstones and the big new block letter sign in the gray flakes of ash falling from the sky like shadows of snow. Welcome, the sign read, perched as it was on a hill overlooking a graveyard. To be continued. Tex Arcana is written and produced by us, Ryan Sheffield and Brad Dewar. Music by Whiskey Folk Ramblers. Additional music by Less Than One and available on freemusicarchive.org. Recorded here in beautiful Denton, Texas. The best community to be uh, in self-isolation with. Seeing the community come together uh, over a number of causes in mutual aid has been very impressive and uh, humbling and and it makes makes us proud to, to call this place home. We'll see you next Friday for part four. And thanks for listening, y'all.